thank you again for this message. Uh, the time is really pushing us, so allow me to introduce the next part of the program, the panels. We have four panels with leading experts from the nuclear and climate fields from really around the world. Um, each panel will be really an intergenerational dialogue discussing the connections between the nuclear world and the environmental world. So again, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A box and then stay tuned for the open discussion after the fourth panel. I'll be introducing each speaker, but if you'd like to read more about their expertise and experience, I recommend to take a look inside the booklet provided to you either in paper or in chat here on Zoom, where you can find short bios for all of our presenters. Uh, the first panel will discuss the short and long-term environmental impacts of nuclear weapons testing and use. And first speaker of panel one could not be here live, so we'll again have a video message. But without further ado, please welcome Ambassador Olsa Suleimeno, president of the Nevada Semipalatings International Anti-Nuclear Movement. Seems that the video is not working yet. I'm not sure if we should give that another second or if we should just move to the mm. panelists that are here, here live with us. All right, so I'm receiving the messages that we should move on, but that's no problem at all. We do have a packed program of experts that are here live with us. So I'll ask the second speaker of panel one, uh, Mr. Mote Brotherson, the member of the National Assembly of France and the French Polynesian Assembly, who's here in London with us in person. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Your Excellency, distinguished representatives. First of all, thank you for the opportunity to be speaking here today. Um, as the old saying goes, uh, in bacon and eggs, the chicken is involved, but the pig is committed. Uh, when it comes to nuclear weapons and nuclear tests, uh, French Polynesia and the Polynesian people were the guinea pigs. Uh, from 1966 to 1996, we have experienced uh, more than uh, 130, uh, sorry, 93 uh, nuclear tests on Morua and Fangataufa Atoll. Uh, we were not the only ones in the Pacific region for uh, the US and the UK have also conducted uh, nuclear uh, tests at, at, at the same period in the Pacific region. What's um, a little bit troubling is that we were talking about climate change and when you look at the Paris Accords or the results of the COP21, there's uh, nothing, absolutely nothing on uh, all those nuclear tests that were conducted in the Pacific region, uh, any, anywhere to be found in, in those uh, accords. Um, we are now facing the consequences of these nuclear tests. We, uh, I'm pretty sure that all countries uh, who have experienced nuclear tests are, are facing the same consequences. We have uh, a lot of uh, pathologies, a lot of cancers, that are occurring at uh, rates that are far more, I would say, uh, troubling than uh, the normal rates that uh, are experienced by the other countries. We have people uh, sick. Uh, you know, when you go to the French Polynesia, everyone in every family has someone who died from the consequences of uh, nuclear tests. So that's not, a, I would say, an easy topic to be discussed when uh, you, you go to our country. But um, I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, lessons are to be learned for, from what has been happening in your country, in my country, and in all those regions in the world where the nuclear tests were conducted. Um, it's a little bit sad to see that nowadays when we talk about climate change, again, the the region of uh, South Pacific is at the forefront of experiencing the, you know, the, the effects of uh, those, uh, this climate change. Uh, in French Polynesia, we have uh, 
approximately 120 islands. 80 of those islands are at sea level. So uh, sea level rising is, a, is an immediate concern to us as it is in Kiribati, in Tuvalu and other Pacific Island countries. So I'm, I'm really hoping that um, the big countries, the big industrial countries uh, who happen to be the same that have been conducting nuclear tests will uh, come to the realization that they have, a, I would say, a big responsibility uh, when it comes to uh, the nuclear weapons, the nuclear tests, but also uh, when it comes to climate change. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'll just give the floor to the second speaker of the panel, Ms. Aigerim Setanova, human rights professional, who is also there in person. Dear Excellencies, distinguished guests, and all the people who are watching us online at the moment, it is my great honor to be here in front of this incredible audience and astonishing panel members. I'm a human rights professional and gender expert from Kazakhstan. Most of my life and career path has been influenced by my hometown, Smipolatinsk. The closure of Smipolatinsk nuclear test site 30 years ago um, has been a significant step towards achieving peace, nuclear weapons uh, free world and um, it's also important that this year uh, 1991 been marked with my country's independence my understanding of the impacts of nuclear weapons testing has irreversibly changed when i as a member of ctbto youth group in 2018 visited the territory of the former nuclear testing site and when I was there, I couldn't help but wonder, is this the place where 456 nuclear weapons had been tested by the Soviet Union? So what should I do with this knowledge now? And I also thought um, how decisions of people in power can influence lives of unaware and innocent human beings. Uh, people in my region, my grandparents and my parents did not even know that their rights had been violated. The place where I was born uh, is a symbol of the mission I'm serving and is also a symbol of the unbearable suffering of millions of women and men from my country. As I'm not an expert in, in the technical details of the influence um, environmental impact of nuclear weapons use and testing, I can only look through the lenses of human rights. Uh, since my expertise is focused on memory, human rights education, and genocide and gross human rights violations that happened um, in the past. As we can see from the history, nuclear weapons testing has also intersecting nature of impact, since it affects disproportionately the most vulnerable groups women, children, indigenous communities, and low-income and rural communities. People who live near areas exposed to radiation have suffered in many ways, physically, psychologically, socially and economically, and environmental impacts have negatively impacted life not only of the previous and present generation, but also future generations. Referring to one of the Core human rights treaties, such as International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, and also on the advisory opinion of the International Court of Justice on the legality of the threat or use of nuclear weapons, I want to touch upon a few points of those rights that can be violated if we use nuclear or use and test nuclear weapons. The first is the right to life. As it fairly put by General Command 36 to the Article 6 of the ICCPR, the threat or use of nuclear weapons and other weapons of mass destruction are the violation of the right to life. It considers the direct responsibility that the state has to take measures to stop the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, to refrain from developing, producing, testing, and using them to destroy existing stockpiles and to take adequate measures of protection against accidental use. And also, most importantly, to afford adequate reparation to victims whose right to life 
has been or being adversely affected by the testing or use of weapons of mass destruction. Second, the right to healthy environment. As dozens of research has been shown to the international community, the impact of nuclear weapons years of testing is absolutely devastating. In its advisory opinion, the ICJ specified that nuclear weapons have the potential to destroy the future environment, food, and the entire ecosystem. Uh, it stated that the radiation released by nuclear explosion would affect health, agriculture, natu natural resources, and demographies. Ionizing radiation can also cause genetic defects and illness in future generations. The, la the latter leads to the interconnected with environmental impact, the right to health. A large amount of studies have shown the continuous effects of the nuclear weapons testing, such as high risk of cancer with higher rates among women, genetic diseases, leukemia, infant mortality, psychological impact, and the list can go on. International Covenant of Economics and Social and Cultural Rights Committee in their, comment, uh, in their general comment 14, the right to the highest attainable standard of health to the article 12 of that convention specifies that sh states should refrain from using or testing nuclear weapons if such testing results in the release of substances harmful for human health. In conclusion, I want to take this opportunity and to express my deepest gratitude to all the people who have been fighting against nuclear weapons testing and use, those millions of people who marched for nuclear abolition and disarmament by seeking justice and contributed to the closure of nuclear test site near my hometown. I also want to um, thank all these women who have been working in this male-dominated field. And last but not least, to all the young people who fought before and to climate and youth peace and security activists of the present time who are taking the enormous responsibility of raising awareness and forcing decision makers to act on the issues such as climate change and the queer weapons threat for something that has been created by people in power from previous generations. I myself, the third generation from those people who has been facing the aftermath of nuclear weapons testing history. The world free from the threat of nuclear weapons is something I would be happy to witness. And it is for the better and pe peaceful life of my generations and future generations after me. Thank you so much and Ilken Rahmet. Thank you so much both Mr. Previson and Ms. Satanova for a fantastic first panel. Um, I'd have so many responses, but I know the time's pushing us. So I'll only say one more of a technical thing. Um, the video messages that we were not able to share in full here um, live, we will put online, but the in-person participants will share the links after the event with everyone who's watching over Zoom, we'll post them in the chat. So everyone will get to see or will have the opportunity to watch the video messages and the introductory remarks that were sent in the in the in the form of a video message okay so moving on to panel two nuclear winter famine and darkness are three terms uh, that are going through our heads when we're talking about both nuclear war and climate change so i'm beyond honored to introduce professor andrea sneedecker and also Ms. Marie Claire Gruff to introduce these two further and to discuss around these. So first, Professor Andreas Sneedecker, who's tuning in via Zoom. Uh, Dr. Niedecker, if you're here, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, would you present the slides as I speak? Uh, when you talk about climate and nuclear weapons, you first have to say what is really urgent to mitigate climate problems, and that is demand a carbon-free uh, environment, uh, use modern technology and change the human behavior. When you then come to the nuclear chain, it is clear that nuclear power does not at all help the climate because it is too expensive, too slow, too risky, and there is no final repository for nuclear waste yet existing. The Finns and the Swedes are building one, but it is not finished. Wastewater from Hiroshima, uh, wastewater from uh, Fukushima will soon 
add to the contamination of the Pacific. Nuclear weapons. Uh, nowadays, it is known that even a small nuclear war, not the big one between big nations uh, uh, causing nuclear winter, even a small war will be a problem. And I will show you why. Climatic and health effects of a regional war. In 2007, Roebuck from um, Colorado University, they uh, presented new uh, meteorological studies on new, based on new models. And they found out that fires and destruction and death are the common effects of a nuclear war, yet dust and smoke uh, emanating after a nuclear bomb, after nuclear bombing has a significant effect on uh, on the sunlight as it does filtering the sunlight. Therefore, the filtered sunlight reduces the growing time uh, on the Earth, and there is a, a significant terrestrial drop in temperatures. Also, there is uh, influence on uh, the precipitation. There is less precipitation in some countries, and the ozone depletion uh, uh, has a negative effect on, on the UVB, uh, of uh, the growth. So uh, I show you a, a table which shows the temperature over the past uh, 80 years and what would a small nuclear war uh, have an effect? You see it on the right. It would have a significant drop as it has never happened over the, over the past uh, nearly one century. And that drop is significant uh, as it causes uh, and this, as it being caused by the smoke and the dust. And it leads to what I already explained, it leads to a change in the growing time, to a shortening of the growing time. This shows uh, what happens in the long range. Here you have on, on the first, um, uh, initially you have to drop and eventually over a period of 10 years, you have a decreased pattern of the agricultural growing time. So what this means is that a small nuclear war not just causes uh, havoc and destruction and death and fires and infrastructure and uh, human loss, it also causes long-term famine. Only when these results came out, suddenly African nations started to become attentive to the issue of nuclear weapons, as in Africa, famine obviously is a current day problem. So here you have a next next slide. Here you have a demonstration of the change in the precipitation uh, over the world. You see the, the darker, the brown, the less precipitation you have. These are models, and these are uh, this is serious peer-reviewed uh, research done uh, in the late uh, in 2010 and before by meteorologists with new models. And the next slide, this slide, go two slides further. This slide shows the decreasing growing time. The darker the blue, the more shortened is the growing time. It is up to 60% uh, less in some areas of the world. You have uh, the entire world and you have the uh, southern hemisphere uh, below. So go back one slide. Now, uh, next slide, next slide, sorry, next slide. Next slide. And next slide. This is the situation in Europe. You see even in uh, Great Britain and in uh, Central Europe, you would have a significant drop. Now, is this a new de detection? Is this a new event? No, it is not. In uh, the uh, 18th century, uh, in the 19th century, in 1815, you had an eruption of a volcano in uh, Indonesia. It was the, uh, the Tambora the Tambora volcano. And the Tambora volcano emanated a, a large amount of dust, uh, as I will show in the next slide. Next. Here you have the Tambora. It emanated 175 square kilometers of volcanic ashes, which equals 50 square kilometers of solid magma. 
And subsequently, in the year after that, in 1816, what you observed in North America and in Europe, in many countries in Europe, you had serious summer frosts and you had snowstorms in England and famine in Germany, Ireland, in France, India, and in my country, Switzerland. So this shows you that a uh, clouding, filtering of the sunlight, as it could happen in a small nuclear war, has a significant effect, not just as the known effects of nuclear war, death and destruction, but loss of sunlight and therefore famine. And it was calculated that uh, over 1 billion of people would be affected by a small nuclear war taking place in the Northern Hemisphere, for example, a war between uh, Pakistan and India over Kashmir, uh, and this is a reality. So in the world, we have many hotspots. You have the South China Sea today, you have Donbas in Europe, you have uh, North Korea, North and South Korea, and there are several uh, regions and the nuclear war is still a reality and uh, countries are modernizing their arsenals. So it is highly important to learn about this climatic effects of nuclear war. And the, in conclusion, uh, risks of nuclear uh, escalation exist, modernization of weapons take place, there is lack of dialogue and uh, increasing challenges globally, uh, water, arable, land, climate uh, migration, and there are several geopolitical hotspots. So, in conclusion, the bombardment of Hiroshima and Nagasaki showed us how immediately hundreds of thousands of people lose their life and many more uh, suffer from cancer later on. Uh, besides the known effect of a nuclear bomb, though, even a small nuclear war with 50 small Hiroshima-like bombs, for example, can have significant climatic influences and lead to major famine for millions or even a billion of people. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Niedecker. Um, the one con of uh, having virtual conferences is that people have many conferences to be on at the same day uh, and Marie Claire Croft will have to leave soon so I will just give her the floor really quickly so that she can share her remarks with you all. Marie Claire Croft is the vice president of the Swiss Youth for Climate Initiative and Marie Claire the floor is yours. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you so much, Wanda, for the introduction. And also thank you so much, Andreas, for the comprehensive overview. I unfortunately have been miscalculating the time and I should already be since five minutes at another meeting, but I will quickly um, bring in my additional remarks to what you, Andreas, mentioned. I would like to especially to specifically focus on the health aspect. And when we talk about health, not only about the physical health, where we all know that due to the climate crisis, but also, of course, due to nuclear wars, as already mentioned, to famines and, and so on, um, there are a lot of physical health aspects, but also would quickly like to focus on the mental health aspects, which is especially alarming for young people who, where we are seeing an increase um, rate of depression, of anxiety amongst the young generation um, because of the climate crisis or of nuclear wars. Um, so as already mentioned, we are quite well aware of the negative effects um, on our health uh, due to the climate crisis. We have been seeing this in many parts of Europe, of, um, of Northern America, but also a lot in, on the African continent um, throughout the summer months um, with the heat waves. We have been seeing fire. We have also been seeing unprecedented floodings, but as well, um, for example, in Madagascar, unprecedented droughts droughts um, and floods, which haven't been even calculated by the International, Double Government, International um, Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, uh, and they, are just, they just released the first uh, chapter of the, um, of the sixth report. And already there, we saw that it, we, we are running into unprecedented, um, catastrophic um, outbreaks from the climate crisis. Nevertheless, what we have been seeing and the health aspect we have been seeing from the disasters happening throughout summer um, haven't even been um, imagined in this in this report. So it's, it, it's pretty scary. But all of this is rather easy to measure. And it's also rather well known in the climate, but also the um, nuclear um, world. Nevertheless, uh, there is 
and an in increasing anxiety, especially amongst young people. There was a recent study from UNICEF uh, that over half of the world's youth population, children, youth population, are under the risk or especially vulnerable to the climate crisis. And a lot of them um, are very exposed, especially because they are not getting the mental support on how to combating this, uh, this kind of quite depressing uh, future outlook um, when, they, when, they are, when they are either working in the climate field, but also when they are on their daily day-to-day -day activities, um, but they are exposed to the threats of the climate crisis or of the nuclear, um, also of the nuclear crisis. So I would love, um, because I really have to go now, um, I would love to also um, highlight or, or, or um, hope that we have an increased awareness on the mental health aspects, um, especially amongst young people when we are talking about the climate crisis, but also when we are talking about nuclear wars and so on. So I'm really, really sorry, Wanda, but thank you so much. And I'm looking very much forward. But also, if there are any further questions to me specifically, I'm very happy to answer later on um, via email. My email can also be found online. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Marie Claire. And thank you to both of the speakers of the panel, too. It was a very information filled session. Um, I hope that you've enjoyed it and learned something, at least the same as I have. Um, I know it may not seem that way, but we're already in the half of our program, which means that it's time for another, another video message, uh, this time from Dr. Robert Floyd, the executive director of the CTBTO. So I hope the technical aspect of the video message will work and we will be able to listen to Dr. Robert Floyd's words. Um, it's, a, it's a great video message. The 29th of August is the International Day Against Nuclear Tests. The day reminds us not only of the devastating effects of nuclear weapons, but also of the terrible legacy of human suffering and ecological destruction left by more than 2,000 tests conducted since 1945. But this day provides us with an opportunity to imagine, to imagine a world free from the threats of nuclear tests and the weapons they create. Imagine a world in which people don't suffer debilitating health consequences of nuclear explosions. Imagine a world in which ocean life isn't killed by underwater explosions or the areas of land rendered uninhabitable due to these tests. Imagine a world where the atmosphere is not contaminated by radioactive fallout. Imagine a world where nuclear proliferation doesn't threaten global peace and security. We don't need to imagine this. We can make it. The Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty seeks to ban nuclear tests everywhere by everyone and for all time. The treaty opened for signature 25 years ago this September. And with ratification of just eight more specific states, this treaty will enter into force and become legally binding. We can ensure a safer world for a future generation. We owe it to them. Let's finish what we've started and end nuclear testing. Uh, thank you so much for this video message. Um, let me just move to the third panel which is all about moving the nuclear weapons money. Um, we'll have two fantastic guests speaking in panel three, uh, Dr. Philip Weber and also Kakashan Basu. Uh, so firstly, I'll invite Dr. Philip Weber, who is the chair scientist for global responsibility, and he is tuning, tuning in via Zoom. So Dr. Philip Weber, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so. If you could put up the first slide, please. Um, I have a few slides to go through, but I just want to thank the organizers for setting up this meeting. It's clearly a very important topic and um, it's fantastic for Kazakhstan to be supporting this and for this event to be happening. And the reminders about the impacts of nuclear testing are very pertinent. Um, you have to 
asked the question, if nuclear testing was so safe, why it was never conducted in around Westminster or near Paris um, or outside New York? Um, and I think that tells you a lot about the supposed safety of nuclear testing. And I mean, in the case of Britain, we tested nuclear weapons in um, areas uh, inhabited by indigenous people who um, weren't even made aware there was a nuclear test happening. That's quite apart from the service personnel who were adversely affected. What I'm going to talk about is, as my, the title says, nuclear weapons, and I'm going to talk about military spending as well as nuclear weapon spending. And I'm going to use the term climate overheating because I think we've got gone beyond climate change. We're now in, in a real emergency situation with our climate really overheating and it's, it's going to accelerate unless we take action. Um, as you, I'm the chairperson of Scientists for Global Responsibility um, and there's a link to our website there. We've got a lot of information about this on our website and we promote responsible science and technology. Clearly nuclear weapons, militarism and overheating your climate are not responsible uses of science and technology. Um, so I'd invite you to go to the website and see a lot of resources relevant to that. So if I could have the next slide, please. So military spending keeps increasing and climate finance that's necessary keeps being much too small. And the, international, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change made this very clear. And there are studies that actually show how societies have been destabilized by climate change. I mean, Syria and Afghanistan are two examples, but I'd also refer to sub-Saharan Africa um, and what's been happening there for, for quite a while. Um, and there's, at the end, I give some references and we will put that up online so that you can look that up as well. It's due to crop failure, migration, forced migration of people who um, have to move because they're basically in a drought, severe drought situation. Um, going to the next slide, please. So global military spending is now just under 2 trillion, which is 2,000 billion, which is a simply staggering sum. And as Dan rightly said at the start, how can you honestly expect to spend this sort of money and expect it not to have wars and conflicts? It doesn't make, it doesn't make sense. The actual investment we require to sort out, we know how to deal with the climate. We know how to create a stable, sustainable climate on this lovely planet we have and which we've evolved in. And we need about a thousand billion dollars. So in other words, that's half of the um, current spending on the overall military. The actual climate spending currently is estimated at about 400 billion. So the shortfall is a third of this excessive military spending. And I think the reason why we've got this situation, most people, I mean, if you say to somebody, oh, well, I've, somebody's just spent a trillion. I don't think most people get their heads around this. And there's the populations are widely misled about spending. Whenever there's a war, the money's found. Whenever there's uh, budgets for new weapons, the money's there. Whenever we want to do something, and I'll just refer to the UK, just to sort out social care, for example, oh, sorry, we can't find the money, or if we need a bit of money for our National Health Service, it's suddenly very difficult to find. Why is this the case? What is going on here? The next slide, please. Next slide. This is about nuclear weapons, but it's the same thing. President Roosevelt in 1961 coined the phrase, the um, military industrial complex. And he was worried about it in 1961. If he was alive now, he'd be even more worried about it. Because basically what's happening is, if you fund nuclear or conventional weapons, you, you are funding massive companies, you're making a lot of money out of it. And in the process, by funding that, you're funding lobbying 
And that lobbying then goes back and lobbies the politicians who then are lobbied to create more money. So it's a, it's a vicious cycle of destruction. So it's driven by a profit motive. It creates a mindset in, the polit in many of the political class that's deeply misleading and also in the media. So the general population are widely misled how we've supposedly got deterrence and how nuclear weapons have kept the peace and all the rest of it. And um, as Dan again said about the uh, disastrous intervention in Afghanistan, nobody can admit that this was a horrific blunder and that uh, that was the trap essentially set for us by bin Laden. And here we are 20 years later um, and the disaster um, continues. I'll now go to some figures about UK uh, spending, please. So, as you know, we have a prime minister who always tells the truth in the UK. Um, so he announced that sarcasm, in case that wasn't obvious, um, he announced back in 2020 another 16 and a bit billion for the Ministry of Defence and 12 billion for a 10 point plan for a green industrial revolution. Sounds fantastic, maybe. Not, not maybe the 16.5 billion for the Ministry of Defence, but what about this 12 billion for a 10 point in green industrial revolution, which um, the Chancellor keeps talking about? So it sounds like, yeah, they're on a par. So, but let's have a look. It's misleading. Next slide. So the reality is that the Ministry of Defence is getting extra spending of 24 billion over four years, and the 10 point plan is getting a maximum of 11 billion over four years. So there's a bit of a disparity there. Next slide. So what, what spending do we actually need? And we've worked out, it's quite hard to dig out the figures, but we've done this analysis in SGR. And Stuart Parkinson, our executive director, found he got these figures together. So the annual spending is 10 billion. The necessary spending is 50 billion. That's according to the Committee on Climate Change. And that's to achieve zero by 2050. Now, that may be too late. If you want to get it done by 2030, the disparity is between three and a bit billion and 15 billion required to deal with, with the, these issues. Uh, next slide, please. And this slide shows the disparity between what's spent on the military for which money is just found and what is spent on reducing carbon emissions. Next slide. And this is, again, looking at it. So the blue on the left is what was already spent on the military. The red is what's additional going to be spent. And then on the right, there's the reducing carbon emissions. And in there, we've got what's being spent, the blue, which is very low, the government spending plans, which is the little red line. And then the other two lines are what would be needed to get to net zero in 2050 and net zero in 2030. So what this shows is a big disparity between what's being spent on the military and what's being spent on reducing carbon emissions and how a small proportion of military spending would easily deal with this um, uh, sorting out the climate. There's lots of reasons to sort out the climate anyway, and there's lots of reasons to diminish the military as well because of the dangers it already poses, but you can compare those figures. Um, next slide. So global nuclear weapon spending 2020 was an excellent report from the International Campaign Against Nuclear Weapons, um, which I'm quoting from here. So in 2020, the nine nuclear arms nations spent just over 72 billion on 13,000 nuclear weapons, which is a staggering sum every minute and an increase over 2019. Um, Next slide. In the UK, um, there was apparently a plan to reduce our nuclear warheads, but then we had an announcement that we were going to increase them now. 
for no sensible reason that I can discern. So the spending is, and this is again, depending on exchange rates you use and various sources, but the spending is about 6.2, 6, just over $6,000 million equivalent a year. We've got 225 warheads. We've got submarines, warheads. We lease US missiles for our submarines, which they have to fit over in America. And we have a reactor program. And now it's been announced, rather than reducing the warheads to 180, they're going to be increased to 260, supposedly to keep us safe. And then the figures, the capital cost of new submarines is about 42,000 million. But, and the life cycle costs is about 270,000 million. Um, so, and the sources for that are the National Audit Office, CND, and the ICANN report. So it's pretty staggering um, sums. Next slide, please. We've also calculated that the UK military carbon footprint, and in fact, the military carbon footprint itself is huge. And as other people have already pointed out, even a supposedly small uh, nuclear conflict, such as between India and Pakistan, which would be incredibly horrendous and devastating with hundreds of millions dying from those explosions, would be catastrophic for the globe. And I updated the figures looking at what one Trident submarine um, could do. Now, one UK Trident submarine, which is different to a US Trident submarine, one UK Trident submarine, we don't know, it probably carries maybe 48 warheads. Uh, an American Trident submarine carries even more, and the warheads are bigger. But anyway, so one Trident, UK Trident submarine has a firepower greater than all the weapons exploded during World War II, and that's including the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs. So it's a staggering firepower in any case. And that, that um, submarine alone could destroy several dozens of cities it could itself create disastrous climatic cooling for the whole globe, quite apart from killing of the order of 10 million people through blast, radiation, burns, casualties, and so on. So, and again, we would argue that we're sold that these nuclear weapons are keeping us safe through this idea of deterrence. But in fact, what they create is the possibility of accidental nuclear war. And it's very hard to see how our UK nuclear weapons make anybody safer. Firstly, if they were used first, they could only be used as a first strike as part of a US first strike, which would be utterly disastrous and suicidal, frankly. And if they use second, the only conceivable time they could be used is after the UK and probably most of Europe is already a radioactive smoking ruin. So what's, what's the point? But we're sold this idea and the nuclear weapon states try and argue, oh yeah, we've got to have nuclear weapons because we've got special requirements. Well, the special requirement is that they've got nuclear weapons. So it's a circular argument. And that's why the treaty on prohibition of nuclear weapons which is now in force is important and that argument's been won and over 135 countries support sensibly the fact that we need to get rid of these things because they're not keeping us safer they're making life much more dangerous and just to go on to the next slide and I'll wrap up very shortly so people often talk about oh look at all the jobs in the military and there's a very strong lobbying initiative over in the United States, for example. They make sure the weapons manufacturers make sure that they create missile bases and production facilities in lots of states. And they've got a specific Democrat and Republican promotion program. So it's cross party in America, and it's like that here. And 
But the climate plan could create 9,000 jobs. So in other words, five times as many for the same amount of government investment. And the other possibility, we've just had a debate in the UK about the costs of care. You could have a care-led recovery. Investment in caring for people would actually create loads of jobs. And the final slide is that the, what our government has chosen is to spend an extra six billion a year on deploying a huge aircraft carrier group to the South China Sea, playing a leading role in ro a robot arms race, drones, exporting weapons to fossil fuel dictatorships, continuing to deploy nuclear weapons and more of them, failing to tackle the climate emergency. And I think the figures um, stand up for themselves. And my key takeaway is that we must dismantle the military industrial complex. We must dismantle the power of the arms and the nuclear weapons lobby. That's what's driving it. And a spurious short-term profit motive, whereas the long-term is the security of our planet, which we can deliver. We know how to do it. And we create a much nicer world for everybody, but less profit for the profit makers in the shorter term. And the final slide, which you don't need to read, and it's too small anyway, is all the references, which I'll be happily posting up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It always gives me a little anxiety to see the numbers written in there in black and white. But it also should do. <laughs> yeah. But also when Youth Fusion is organizing different roundtables with students, then we talk about like how many seconds of nuclear open spending would cover your student debt. Um, that's just those conversations are, are, are so interesting and, and so petrifying, to be honest. But um, speaking of students and of uh, young people, um, I'd like to invite Ms. Kakashan Basu, the founder and CEO of the Green Hope Foundation, uh, to continue with panel three and moving the nuclear weapons money. So Kekashan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and good morning from Toronto, Canada. Two of our time's greatest challenges, as we all know, is posed by climate change and the threat from nuclear weapons. However, there is a greater menace, one that is deadlier and more sinister, one that serves to accentuate the dangers posed by the climate nuclear nexus, and that is the threat from human apathy. It is our deep-rooted nonchalance of complacence that I refer to as an acute manifestation of myopia that has allowed the threat from nuclear weapons and climate change to grow and fester much as a cancer would, eating away, hollowing our entrails, and inexorably pushing us to the edge of a precipice from where there can be no return. And it's this apathy that allows some to burn billions to fuel their space missions at a time when millions can't even get their first dose of the vaccine, where mothers in a northeastern state of India are selling their kidneys so that their children can get food and medical assistance during this pandemic. Now, much of my work is with communities in rural LDCs and amongst Indigenous peoples whose lives have been upended by this human apathy that allows corporations to categorize Indigenous lands as deserts to justify its pollution and degradation from uranium mining or its degeneration from the impacts of climate change and biodiversity loss. These are the people who are least responsible for this degradation, yet the irony is that they suffer the most from its consequences. So it is critically important to expose this concept of paranoias, two words in Latin that exemplify this colonialism and translated, this literally means nobody's land. And this is how Western colonists classify lands that they seek to exploit, even when these territories have been inhabited by generations of people who have used their traditional knowledge to thrive symbiotically. COVID-19 has amplified these existing inequalities 
and pushing them further back into the mire of deprivation and poverty. Amongst our many projects at Green Hope Foundation, one of them has been with an indigenous forest dependent community in coastal India. Literally cut off from modern civilization, they have been mute and helpless witnesses to the destruction of their mangrove ecosystems from pollution and logging, leaving them exposed to sea storms. And the increasing frequency of typhoons, be it Cyclone Isla or this year's superstorm Cyclone Amphan and Yas, killed thousands in these communities, not one of which gets reported. We, as a youth-led civil society organization, spend our meager resources in building resilience within these people, providing them with the support to regenerate their local environment and giving them the skills to establish a local circular economy so that they can rebuild their lost livelihoods. One US dollar equates to a day's meal for a family of five in these villages. Now compare that to the $4 billion that goes into making one Trident submarine. Isn't that gross? To me, it is. The, this nuclear weapons money could be used to ensure that the communities have protection from climate change, that they have food to eat, that they do not die because they could not get access to a hospital bed during this pandemic. But what befuddles me is that this doesn't appear as this flagrant apathy to these erudite wise people who guide policy making and guide the politics of nuclear armed states. And what allows them to act with impunity is the overall apathy of the general populace who just shrug and change their TV channel whenever posed with the dilemma, assuming that climate change will only flood villages in the Congo or Nepal places too far away to bother about. But it's about time that they woke up because it is knocking at our doorstep. The forest fires are burning down cities and towns from across the North American continent. I mean, just last month, Lytton, a town in Canada, was hotter than the Robokali empty quarter desert. We are way behind from where we should actually have started taking action, but there is still some semblance of hope if we stop this wastage of resources and move the nuclear weapons money that is the epitome of profligacy into meaningful development to rebuild better so that future generations are not left to deal with a barren planet. We need to build a culture of empathy instead of a culture of war and ensure that our money is well spent on reviving lives instead of destroying them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kekashan. Um, and thank you to both the panelists. Thank you for talking, not just about the numbers and the data, but also about the apathy and encouraging us to have hope and to act. Um, I'll just add that if you are interested in nuclear divestment and in general moving the nuclear weapons money, um, I'd encourage you to check out the Move the Nuclear Weapons Money campaign at nuclearweaponsmoney.org. Um, it is an interesting project, super easy to get involved. It's so just something for everyone to, to see. Uh, so without further ado, let me introduce the fourth and final panel of today. Uh, which will be devoted to the nuclear climate nexus, international law, but also the civil society action. We'll have two fantastic speakers, first Rob Manfred and then Nicola and Hans. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Rob, who's the senior advisor to PNND and the World Future Council and is in London in person. So Rob, the floor is yours. Thank you, Vanda. It's my, yeah, it works. Uh, well, very difficult to say anything of substance in five minutes, but I'll try. Um, the development of international laws that pertains to nuclear weapons is very much entangled with the, the legacy of nuclear testing. Because as my neighbor on the panel already remarked, after three decades of nuclear testing in the Pacific, first by the United States, 
then the United Kingdom, and then ultimately France, in 1973, it was the first time that the International Court of Justice in The Hague considered before itself issues related to nuclear weapons. Because in response to the atmospheric testing that had been conducted in the region, New Zealand, very much also apprehensive about the prospect of further testing in the region, went to the International Court of Justice together with Australia in two separate cases against France. And they requested from the court a provision that, or a judgment rather, that any future nuclear tests would be in violation of international law. Now I should say that France disputed the jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice and never even showed up for the proceedings. A month after New Zealand filed the case, the International Court of Justice issued provisional measures noting that France should refrain from any further nuclear tests until the court had come to a judgment on the merits. But that judgment on the merits never came. Instead, a year later in December 1974, the court made it clear that there would be no further um, judgments as France had by then announced that they would stop nuclear testing after 1973, and thus the court found that the case brought by New Zealand and Australia had, ren had been rendered moot. So there was no consideration of any of the substance of the claims issued by New Zealand and Australia. But the issue wasn't over yet, because just over two decades later, as I don't have to Tell many of you here, but definitely not my neighbor here. The newly elected uh, French president Jacques Chirac in 1995 made it clear, he announced that France would resume nuclear testing later that year with a series of eight final tests in the region. Clearly by then, the whole world were fully aware of the horrific consequences of nuclear testing and this announcement led to tremendous backlash, but mostly from the region. New Zealand notified France that it would again have to go to the International Court of Justice to solve or resolve this issue. New Zealand tried to reopen the case from 1973-1974. Now there's no um, time, one second, there's no time today to delve into the issues that were played out at the time, but needless to say, the court um, dismissed the claims, but never entertaining the actual merits of the judgment. But the court made it clear that its decision to dismiss, which had to do with an admissibility issue, nothing on the substance, was without prejudice to the obligations of both New Zealand and France to protect the natural environment. What's even more interesting is that five Pacific states intervened in the cases, made it, making it very clear that this issue was not just important to New Zealand, but to the entire region. That case, the 1995 nuclear test case between New Zealand and France, is also very interesting because it developed a lot of key principles in international environmental law, such as the precautionary principle, and the principle of intergenerational equity. These are principles that we are seeing that we see being played out today in the wave of climate litigation around the world. During the 1995 contentious case between New Zealand and France, of course, at the same time, the court was considering the advisory opinion that, was, uh, tasked, that it was tasked with. This had nothing to do with nuclear testing, but rather with the legality of use or threat of use of nuclear weapons. But the testing issue was never uh, far removed from considerations at the court. A lot of countries that had fallen victim to testing showed up for the proceedings in the, in the advisory opinion, both through written and oral statements. Now, in the end, the court held in the advisory opinion unanimously that there exists an obligation under international law to negotiate in good faith and bring to conclusion negotiations leading to nuclear disarmament. Now this proved, yet again 20 years later, in 2014, to be part of the reason the Marshall Islands, this time it was again a contentious case, took the nine nuclear armed states to the International Court of Justice for failure of 
um, implementing their nuclear disarmament obligations under the non-proliferation treaty and customary international law. Now again, these cases were not about nuclear testing, but the legacy of nuclear testing and some of the principles about intergenerational equity and the precautionary principle were very much part and parcel of those proceedings. And of course, the former foreign minister of the Marshall Islands who unfortunately passed away a few years ago, Tony de Broom, shared with the court in those proceedings some of his own eyewitness accounts of the nuclear tests in his neighborhood. Now, these are just some of the cases, well, these are actually all of the cases that the court have had to consider nuclear weapons. And it's very interesting to see that there's a 20 year period between each of those instances. For some reason, every 20 years, the stars align and the court has yet again to, has again the opportunity to consider nuclear weapons, but there's a tremendous hesitancy or reluctance to actually treat the issue on its substantial merit. Now, I wanna end my presentation by just noting that of course, behind these cases, there are tales of human suffering and human injustice, but also resilience and defiance. And I think just to link it to the topic of discussion today about the climate nuclear ne nexus, there's one particular cautionary tale that should give us all pause for thought. The people of the Bikini Atoll Islands in the 1940s were removed from their lands because the United States wanted to test nuclear weapons there. They were unable to return because their lands had been declared uninhabitable after the tests had been conducted. And now, the tiny patches of earth that they, were, they were relocated to in the Marshall Islands are again at risk of disappearing this time due to climate change. And that should give us all pause for thought as that is a fate that we're all working hard to avoid, but for many people around the world is a daily reality. Thank you very much. Thank you very much Rob, for the wonderful presentation and also for the slightly depressing ending of it. Um, so with that, I'll give the floor to Nicole and Hans, who's the co-founder and coordinator of the I Am Climate Justice Movement, who's tuning in from the Philippines. So Nicole, the floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you, Vanda, for the introduction. It is a great honor to be joining you all from our side of the world. And I apologize in advance for any background noise. I live near a busy road here in the Philippines. So anyway, today I am privileged to represent the world's youth for climate justice on the ongoing youth campaign to take the biggest problem of our generation to the highest court in the world, the International Court of Justice. So in our campaign for an advisory opinion on climate change and human rights, we recognize the linkages between climate change and several pressing problems of our time, one being the threat of a nuclear war. In fact, both are considered as principal threats to the survival of humanity. So climate change is increasingly being called a security problem, with speculations on how it may increase the risk of violent conflict, it is already contributing to geopolitical conflicts around the world, um, as what our esteemed speakers have exhaustively explained earlier, earlier climate change induced extreme weather events such as floods, storm droughts, and heat waves are occurring with rising regularity, resulting in the death and displacement of thousands of people. So this increases the risk of war and the use of nuclear weapons. The inequality and vulnerability brought about as well as exacerbated by climate change across various social demographics all over the world, increasingly undermine human security in the present day and will increasingly do so in the future by reducing access to and the quality of natural resources that are important to sustain livelihoods. So climate change is also likely to undermine the capacity of states to provide opportunities and services that help people to sustain their livelihoods. Yet despite an increased understanding of the climate and nuclear threat and a growing urgency for action on both fronts, little attention has been given to how they may interact with each other. So this nexus between climate change and the threat of nuclear war is urgent and crucial because both threaten life on a planetary scale. So both require a global response as well. 
In fact, the impacts are so overarching that the ICJ in its advisory opinion on the legality of the threat of use of nuclear weapon has referred to the need to protect generations unborn. Thus, it comes as no surprise that there is a growing interest among the youth to clarify state obligations under international law to protect the rights of present and future generations from the adverse effects of climate change. Because for many of us, especially from our humble archipelago, this threat is existential. What is at stake is full enjoyment of our basic human rights. For us in the world's youth for climate justice, we recognize the ICJ being the right international forum to hear evidence of law and fact that will help deliver a verdict that could assist in paving the way for the development of law that can help, among many other things, remove room for real doubt on climate science, inform public consensus on climate change. So a catalyst for more ambitious climate action. To reiterate what the court said in its advisory opinion on the legality of the threat of use of nuclear weapons, the environment is not an abstraction, but represents living space, the quality of life, and the very health of human beings, including generations on board. And so as we are racing against time to prevent climate change from exceeding global tipping points, there must be no room for ambiguity on state obligations. Marginalized communities who are suffering dispro disproportionately from the impacts of climate change must be ensured that their human rights are not discounted. So on behalf of the world's youth for climate justice, our sincerest gratitude to all the organizers for all your wonderful work. The uh, salamat and my buhay. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much. I personally am a big fan of Nicole's work, so thank you for it. And thank you for proving that young people can and do change things. And thank you to both panelists for tackling the issues of nuclear weapons and climate change using international law and giving us such a good overview of, overview of the developments in, in those fields. So this concludes all of our panels. I would like to thank again all the panelists, mm -hmm. but also everyone being here with us, whether online or in person. Um, the last thank you I'd like to give before we move on goes to the wonderful Nico Edwards, who you can see on the screen, but who has truly done a tremendous job from Youth Fusion's side organizing this event. So thank you, Nico. We're honored that you're part of Youth Fusion's team. Now, this is it from me. It's time to give the floor back to Dan, who will guide us through the open discussion. So Dan, over to you in London. <laughs>